Hi everyone, Tom Loria here. Welcome back to the shop and welcome to episode four. And episode four is going to concern itself with just one thing, building a harpoon. It's a pretty important piece of equipment in the whaleboat, so I thought it kind of deserved its own little episode all by itself. Let's take a look and see how we can make one look really convincing at scale. Let's get started. Before we try building a harpoon, it's a good idea to take a look at the artifact we're trying to recreate and focus on a few key points. Note here that all the historical photos in this section are from Thomas G. Lytle's book, Harpoons and Other Whalecraft, and the video clips are from the 1922 Down to the Sea in Ships. Now, the first thing that we should probably do is to find the purpose of the tool and that will lead us to other aspects of the harpoon's evolution and construction. What was its main function? How was it used? What materials were used and why? And what style of harpoon would be most appropriate for my model? Let's take each question in turn. The harpoon's main function in fact, its only function was to attach the whale to the boat. These irons were not designed to kill the whale, although later developments would change that. The boat would be maneuvered as close to the whale as possible. The mate, who commanded the boat, would give the order to the harpooner to stand up. When they could get no closer to the whale without alarming it, the mate would then give the order, give it to him, and the harpooner would dart the iron. If there was time, a second iron also attached to the whale line would be darted as insurance. If there was no time, the second harpoon would just be pitched out of the boat as it was alive, and it would not do to have an eight foot long object with a razor's edge banging about the boat. At this point, the whale took the crew on the Nantucket sleigh ride, and the poles of the harpoons would usually come out of their sockets, and that's okay because they serve no further purpose at this point. And the success or the failure of this hunt came down to a forged piece of iron seven inches long and four inches wide. These harpoons would be exposed to stresses we would have a hard time imagining. They had to be malleable above all else. There was no point in using good steel in these, even for the cutting edges. If you'll forgive the pun, there was just no point to it. It was very likely that this harpoon may only survive the one voyage. So cheap, easy to produce, and workable were the criteria by which these things were made. In this photo you can see just how malleable they can be. This is an example of a harpoon being tested for its suitability for the job. If it didn't break after this, it was straightened out and then put into service. Lances were made with the same attributes. In this little clip from Down to the Sea and Ships, you'll actually see the mate banging his lance iron on the railing of the boat to straighten it out again. So clearly, flexibility and strength were key elements here. Harpoons have been around for a long time, but I think for our purposes, we should limit the scope of our investigation to a plus or minus 20 year period around the target date of the model. That'll do nicely. There were three popular styles of harpoons being used in this time frame. And they're also probably the most recognizable. The single flute, the double flute, and the toggle head. A glance at this table found on page 16 of Thomas Lytle's book clearly shows the progression from fixed head irons to the toggle headed irons over a 21 year period. The inference here 
is that the toggle head iron must have been incredibly more effective at securing a boat to a whale. And for our model, circa 1870, it wouldn't be impossible to see a fixed head iron on the boat, just not very likely. And even if there were some cranky old holdouts who said, I ain't using that newfangled thing, I'll stick with my old single fluted iron. I'm pretty sure that the owners, and so the captain, and so the mate, probably would have to say, this is a commercial venture. These new irons are better than the old ones, and it's what we're using on this here ship. So either you can use it, or you can trade places with the cabin boy. Well, hopefully after that brief history lesson, complete with dramatic dialogue, you've got a better idea of what we need to accomplish. And not to put too fine a point on it, here's a photo with the names of all the parts. So, how big do we make these things? When I first started building whaleboats, there wasn't much info that was easily available. Luckily for me, I was living on Nantucket at the time. So I went to the Nantucket Whaling Museum and asked one of the curators if I could take some measurements of the display of a fully equipped beetle whaleboat. He agreed, so I measured everything in that display. I now had the dimensions for everything I needed to make all of these parts, and I had the satisfaction of knowing that the dimensions came from articles that were actually used in the trade. Now keep in mind that these are the dimensions for the whale craft that I measured in one museum. If you went to other museums, I'm sure you could find different sizes for the same items. Many things at the time were generalized, not standardized. Let's address the pole first. Looking at this drawing, two things are readily apparent. First, it's clear why I never made my living as a draftsman. And second, and more importantly, is we need to make the harpoon pole 64 inches long. The poles of real harpoons were generally made from hickory saplings, roughly two inches in diameter. It was said that the bark was left on so as to give the harpooner a better grip. And what do we use for this? Privet hedge is a great choice. It comes in a wide variety of sizes. It's easy to work and widely available, either in your front yard or maybe your neighbor's. If you don't have a seasoned stash, and I can't imagine why you would, it's easy to get one. Just a casual walk around the neighborhood with a pair of garden shears should net you a lifetime supply and leave your surroundings all the neater for it. So you can season your harvest by stripping off any leaves, spreading them out on a baking dish, and putting them in a warm, say a 225 degree Fahrenheit oven for about an hour or so. Now, once I've selected my pieces, I leave the bark on and cut them to a length. In our particular case for this boat, that's two inches. And I trim off any of the small buds just to bring them down a bit. I don't want them removed completely, but just a little. Now the iron shaft was anything from a fat half inch up to a scant three quarters of an inch in diameter. So we're gonna split the difference and make ours five eighths of an inch that's 19 thousandths. So in one end of the pole blank, I drill a hole roughly 20 thousandths just to give myself a little clearance. I prepare the wire of an appropriate size for the iron by cutting it to length with an extra 3 sixteenths of an inch to allow for one end to be inserted into the pole and the other end to be joined to the head. Now you can use copper wire for this, which is the softest and it's also the easiest to deform. Or you can use brass, which is a bit harder, or music wire, which is the hardest by far. But if you use this, use a good stout pair of end nippers or diagonal cutters. Your fine hobby cutters will be ruined on the first shot if you try and use them. Now the wire is inserted into the pole and the top 3 sixteenths of an inch is tapered down to meet the wire. And at this point, it really doesn't matter whether you continue on with the rigging of the harpoon or you start making the head. I'll start with the former and save the latter for later. 
Now, as you've probably guessed by now, I'm not going to make a socket for the iron. There's really no point to it, because the next step is just going to cover it up. We have to serve that area. To do this, I use black silk sewing thread and a simple overhand knot slid down to the point of the joint between the iron and the pole is secured and I just use a spot of glue to keep it all in place. I also put a small dab of glue on the tapered section and that holds the serving in place. And here we just wind until we get all the way down to the end of the taper and secure that with a dot of glue as well. Mounting the iron strap comes next. The iron strap was made from a piece of manila rope, also about 5 eighths of an inch in diameter, sometimes a little less. Here you have the option of doing it as in actual practice or with a slight modification, and I'll show you samples of both. But I think at this scale, the actual method looks a bit bulky. But whichever option you pick, here's how I do it. I start with a length of 18 thousandths linen line, linen if you have it, cotton or silk if you don't, and I dab the end into CA glue to stiffen it up, and I make a marlin splice. And if you haven't seen my video on splices and thimbles, I'll put a link in the description below. The splice goes down, over the iron, down to the joint between those two pieces, and it's snugged up into place and touched with a dab of glue. If, like me, you haven't trimmed the end of the serving line yet, this is a good time to do it. And the eye splice can now be trimmed too. If you opt for the actual practice, all you need to do is take a half turn over the iron and then snug it up to the splice. If you're using white glue, this will dry clear, but not right away. And if you're using CA glue, be very careful not to overuse it. This stuff will darken the line color significantly, and it will be noticeable. Now, two or three seasons are used to secure the iron strap. And again, silk sewing thread, only this time medium brown, to indicate a lightly tarred line. An overhand knot and two or three turns around the pole are all it takes. And whether you use two or three seasonings, make the last one about two-thirds from the socket end. You'll see this in just a minute. Now that second seizing, that's at the point where we're going to make our second eye splice. Now remember, this splice has to be large enough for the whale line to be secured to it. It should probably represent a splice at about 8 or 10 inches long. And when it's rigged on the boat, it will have to appear as if the weight of the splice and the whale line are drawing it down. So it's a good idea to try and persuade the line to hang that way by bending it in that direction and then putting a bit of glue on it. White glue diluted with water would work just fine for this. And now we can move on to the business end of the harpoon. For this whaleboat, 
I'm choosing toggle heads. And for this scale, I start with a piece of brass flat stock, about a quarter inch wide and about a 32nd of an inch thick. I've coated it with layout fluid and referring to the drawing, I lay out the head on the stock. An emery wheel mounted in the Dremel does most of the excess stock removal. And then it's just a matter of using files to shape it all down. When I'm satisfied with the look of things, I cut it free from the stock and mount the head upside down in a vise. Then, using a jeweler saw and some files, I cut a groove in the bottom of the head. This groove is where I'll attach the shaft to the head with a dab of glue. You can also solder this, but it really isn't necessary. The only thing left to do is double check the shape of things and make sure that everything's the way you like, and if not, make any necessary adjustments, and then blacken the iron and the toggle. Now, the chronically observant among you will notice that the shape of the harpoon head has changed a bit from its earlier look to its final look. Now, this is where that second look I talked about pays off. The head looked okay, but there was something that was just not quite right. One or two minutes with a, with a file, and all's right with the world. Now, by the way, to blacken the metalwork, I use gun bluing. I don't use paint. And the gun bluing I use is Birchwood Casey Perma Blue. It will turn most metals black, and unlike paint, it doesn't add any bulk to the look of the piece, and you can actually control how deep the color gets to an extent. Just make sure that before you start and after working on your metal pieces, you rub them down with some, some kind of solvent. Denatured alcohol is good, acetone is good, or lacquer thinner. They'll all do. And that's the harpoon, start to finish. The lances are done largely the same way, the main difference being in the fabricating of the cutting head and the placement of the last seizing, much closer to the end of the pole, but I'll cover that in more detail in another video. I know this seems like an awful lot to go through just to produce one piece for a model, but like I've said in other videos, this is not just a part to go on a whaleboat model you're building. It is a model of a harpoon, and it needs to fit seamlessly into its surroundings on the larger model. For me, at least, that mindset helps crystallize how important it is to really try and understand all the aspects of the subject that you choose to model. If this still seems obsessive, you can take some consolation in knowing that only two harpoons actually need heads on them. The others will be stowed under a protective cover on the starboard side of the boat. The same goes for the lances on the port side. In fact, you can hide all the lance heads, but that's up to you. You know, I think this is a good place to bring this video to a close. Looking ahead to episode 5, we'll be dealing with more whalecraft details, and we'll start the interior framing the stem, the stern, the outer keel, all of that, and we'll take a look at a couple of jigs to make life a bit easier. So until I'm with you again, be well, be safe, now get back in the shop.